Um, we are going to be given a tour by Mr. Steve Albini. This is his basement Hi. studio. Have you ever heard of a music producer who hates being called a producer? Or one who refused to be paid for super successful albums? Literally every dollar I would get paid would mean that was a dollar that Dave didn't get, or Chris didn't get, or Kurt didn't get. Not only was Albini a legend in the music industry, but did you know he was also quite the poker player? That's right, he didn't just play cards casually. This guy actually won two World Series of poker bracelets. So let's discover together the evolution of Steve Albini from his modest beginnings to produce an impressive array of thousands of tracks. And if you like what you hear, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you're new here. Steve Albini was born in 1962 in Missoula, Montana. As a child, he moved around the United States a lot because his father worked for the U.S. Forest Service and often had to relocate. This allowed Albini to experience a variety of musical influences from an early age, as he got a taste of different regional music scenes across the country. During his teenage years, Albini got really into the punk rock scene, which was just starting to grow. He loved punk's raw and direct approach, which was a big departure from the more polished mainstream music. This experience with punk music greatly shaped his values and style, especially when it came to making music himself. In 1981, Steve Albini was the lead singer, guitarist, and main songwriter for the band Big Black. This group from Chicago was known for its loud and harsh sound. After Big Black ended, Albini joined another band called Rapeman in 1987. This is our anti-vegetarian song. It's called Steak and Black Onions. This band was known for its intense and aggressive music, as well as Albini's unique singing. Later, in the 1992, he formed a new band named Shellac. Shellac is recognized for its simple, guitar-focused music, and again, Albini's distinctive voice stands out. As he grew older, Albini developed a strong sense of independence and a critical view of the corporate side of the music industry. Because in 1980s Chicago, things were different. Back then, it wasn't easy for bands to get recording equipment in their homes or garages. According to Albini, in the bustling punk scene of Chicago at that time, bands would toil away for years without ever making a recording. The most they could manage was to put together demos to try and get noticed. Albini himself learned to record because his band wanted to make a demo. He kept at it until he finally had a studio, though it drained his finances twice over. Steve Albini's decision to become a music and sound engineer turned out to be a very lucky move for him. Did you buy this house with the intent of making your studio here? Well, no, I bought it because I intended to live here. Um, but having a studio here is, was the idea. I mean, whenever, I knew wherever I was going to live, I was going to try to build a studio there. It's not a commercial enterprise. I don't do it to make money. I just I like having a studio around that I can screw around in and other people can record. Mm -hmm. And the world needs cheap, shitty 8-track basement studios. He became famous for his work, especially in the alternative rock scene. One of his most famous projects was with the Pixies, a big name in alternative rock. He produced their 1988 album, Surfer Rosa. This album is considered very important in the indie and alternative rock world. Albini's style of production, which was bold and straightforward, matched perfectly with the Pixies' sound. This sound was both rough and tuneful, and it really stood out because of Albini's work. Another significant collaboration was with Nirvana on their 1993 album In Utero. Unlike their earlier album Nevermind, which had a very polished sound, In Utero came out much more raw and unfiltered thanks to Albini. This was seen as a surprising collaboration as Nirvana had become a hugely successful mainstream band, which was at odds with Albini's anti-commercial ethos. I got involved 
in the Nirvana in Utero record when Kurt called me and asked me if I'd be willing to do it. In In Utero, they did intentionally want to make a more primitive record. The band sound was unvarnished. The vocals that Kurt is singing are his first take of singing the song. Albini also worked with PJ Harvey on her 1993 album, Rid of Me. Performing the title song from a new CD, Rid of Me, please welcome PJ Harvey. This album let PJ Harvey's strong vocals and songwriting skills shine against Albini's distinctly rough production style. This collaboration is considered a high point in both their careers. Steve Albini has worked on thousands of collaborations, and he credits his success to his unique approach to production. He focuses not on directing the band's creativity, but rather on capturing their true essence. Essentially, Albini sees himself not just as a producer, but more as an engineer who aims to record the band's natural sound and energy. He encourages bands to bring their live performance vibe into the studio, preserving their raw stage presence during recording sessions. His approach revolves around capturing the rawness and authenticity of a band's sound. To achieve this, he used specific and equipment that he swears by. He usually opens the session by chatting with bands to get a clear picture of what they want from the recording. Um, just uh, clue me in on your general practice. Do you guys play as a group together often, or have you just is this the first time you've done it? Or? He really pushes band members to visualize the kind of record they're aiming for. Instead of dragging out overdub sessions, he likes to keep things efficient by consolidating them. Plus, he insists on bands bringing their live energy into the studio. He even suggests they stick to their usual pre-show routines, like smoking up or having a few beers, to keep things authentic. Furthermore, Steve Albini has a strong preference for using analog gear. I'm, I'm certain that analog recordings will survive over a scale of centuries. I have no certainty about any digital formats surviving that period. According to him, digital recording techniques can sometimes introduce changes that compromise the music's original quality. By sticking to analog, Albini aims to maintain the music's true dynamics and subtle details. There's a bit of a magic sound notion associated with analog tape. People think that the process of recording to tape changes the sound in some magic way, and that's what makes it good. It's very rare that I would use the tape machine outside of its normal parameters as a special effect. By now, you've probably realized how straightforward Steve is. Well, he has quite a few gripes about the industry, and he's not shy about sharing them. The number one mistake that bands make is to think that they can outsmart a system. They think, well, if we get involved in this sort of professional way of doing things, this sort of mainstream way of doing things, like if we get an account, if we get a, a manager and a booking agent and a record label and a promotions person, you know, a public relations person, and, you know, we pay all of these people to, to facilitate different aspects of our career. And that system exists to support itself. It doesn't exist to support the, the bands. So that's the biggest sort of business mistake that bands can make, is to think that, that this system, can, that they can just sort of jump into this system and somehow avoid what appears to be pure mathematics. Um, the way to avoid that is to do as much of the, as much of the administration and as much of the, the sort of support for your band uh, doing as much of that yourself as possible. All right, guys, now in his honor, we'd love to hear from you. What's your favorite work of Steve Albini? Leave your thoughts in the comments sections below. And don't forget to hit that like button while you're here. Thanks for tuning in and catch you in the next video.